Show your whole soul fearlessly. And that's the good, the bad, and the ugly. You don't have to be some sort of paragon of virtue. All these experiences are just there for growth, expansion, evolution, and it's a gift. So. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the channel for our second fireside chat. Thank you for joining us today. I'm so excited to be here with Jeff Olson. It's an honor. It's so good to be with you. Thank you. Karen Thomas, I'm glad to be here and looking forward to all of us getting to, to chat and share. Jacob Cooper. Thank you for having me. And Anastasia Westlink Mollering. Such a pleasure to be here. Can I just say what a thrill it is to have the opportunity to be not only with you, but with Karen and Jake and Anastasia. I, I have rarely had, you know, it's, I mean, I, I do a lot of things like this, but I don't often get to be surrounded by uh, new death experiencers and people that are doing so much good in the world. So thank you. I am equally just as excited. I know all of these faces and names and feel like I am definitely the, the newcomer to the group here and have learned so much from listening to everybody's story here. So I'm really honored to be a part of this group and have the conversation about all of our experiences and what we've taken away from those. Really excited to be together with folks that I have learned so much about from, in the case of, of Jeff and, and Jake, reading their books. You know, I, I agree with everything that everyone just said. I grew up an athlete, you know, and I played a lot of team sports. And so when I do interviews, it kind of reminds me of playing, you know, singles tennis, where it's just me and the interviewer, which is great. You know, nothing wrong with volleying, you know, but here there's a strength in the group, there's strength in the pack. And I think with near-death experiencers, we're growing five to 10% of the population, as they say, and there's, there's a growing number of us. So there's a strength in numbers. So I agree. I think it's beautiful that we're doing this. So thank you. So the first question I have, number one, is if you could sum up the message of your near-death experience or the most important thing that you brought back, what would it be and how has it changed you? Who's got the fastball tonight? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start with the $10 million question. <laughs> uh, and yeah, that, it, it's a great question. I mean, and I've been asked, well, you know, gosh, what's the one thing? That, that you bring back. And, and for me, and I'll be as concise as, as I can, it, it is love. It is unconditional love. And it's, it's that we have that choice, you know, that I am in control of my life. I am a manifestation of, of the divine creator in such a way that I can choose. I can choose to be angry. I can choose to be resentful. I can choose joy and I can choose to be love and to show up as the unconditional love that I experienced. And there aren't words to describe or explain that unconditional love that, that was a part of my experience. But coming back, it's like, wow, if I can be in some small way that for even one person, that's, that's the takeaway to me. I have to second that motion. <laughs> I really do. Love is the thing that you come back for with, you know, and once you've been in that unconditional love, you, you just have such a difficult time trying to put it into words to people, but it takes away um, so much in the way of judgment, in the way of anger, animosity, all those negative emotions. You do, you're a human being. You're still living a very human life. And so you'll have encounters where those types of emotions come up to you. But knowing that that unconditional love of our creator is there within all of us um, just makes such a big difference. It, it's, it's entirely different in how you go through every day. And when you have an opportunity to express that unconditional love to someone else, anyone that you might encounter. It just is so fulfilling to be able to do that and to be able to let them know that they are part of our creator. They have that unconditional love as well. Um, so 
that's what I've, I've found is the most important thing. Yeah. I think I know one of your former guests is Christian. He wrote a book called uh, A Walk in the Physical. And I learned so much from my colleagues. And I think that's a wonderful title, but I would agree with him that this is just an experience. It's experience of ourselves. And it's, most importantly, it's experience of our inner being. And I think so much of this is being able to have recollection of how we are so much more than our judgments and the world that we were you know, shaped in and brought up in. And it's just a reminder, you know, from the greatest points of suffering that so many people have, you know, that deep in there, there's an eye in the hurricane and that's a beautiful place to be in. And, you know, I think near-death experiences and transformative experiencers really touch, you know, that point and remind everyone of that infinite reality as not just a possibility. Yeah. And I, I'll echo everything that each one has already said. And I, I think for me, it was really quite an awareness and epiphany that we just were not just our physical bodies. These bodies are here to give us an experience here in a physical life. But what we are is so much bigger, so much more infinite, so much more complex than any words that any of us have ever come up with. We all struggle. And I know some that have had, you know, their near-death experiences, you know, recently and some that have had them decades ago. And regardless of how much time has passed, it's such an intimate and personal experience. We can feel it within us, but the vocabulary that really reflects that experience is it's just not there. It lacks. It lacks everything, but we, we try our best with as many metaphors and comparisons as we possibly can to get there. But ultimately, the experiences here are all accentuated through this connection that we can build back to that awareness that we are so much more than our body. And through that, that connection, that feeling, um, we cultivate the greatest and the strongest love, not only for just the people and the loved ones in our lives, but for all of existence, for this entire experience. Beautiful. Thank you, guys. Does anyone have anything else they want to say before we move on? No? Okay. So question two, and I'll preface this by saying it is not a trick question. Oh, this is, it can make people nervous sometimes, but because a lot of my viewers come from a deconstructing Christian background, this is of real interest to them. Who is Jesus to you and how would you best describe his role? Wow. Do I, am, I, am I the guy that, <laughs> that gets this? I mean, this is such a loaded question because I, I grew up in a conservative Christian home. Mm -hmm. And, and, and gosh, that was the world to me. And, and in many ways it still is, but it has expanded in such a, 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 a beautiful way. And, and, and I might articulate this for a little bit, but, you know, I, I grew up believing that life was a test that God would judge me, you know, and, 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 and yet I was probably failing the test and was probably in trouble and. And boy, somebody will have to say, because in and of myself, I'm no good, right? The interesting thing in the experience, and this, this turned things inside out and upside down. So, but in the experience, I realized that life was not so much a test. It was an absolute gift. It was the beautiful, glorious gift. And the judgments, you know, that I thought or believed would be coming my way, <clears throat> that Judgments and comparisons just went out the window. There was so much unconditional love. And, and, you know, we say that word and say that term, but boy, unconditional, you know, it seems that we put conditions on all love in, in, in this realm. We put conditions on everything. And I, you know, I experienced something so unconditional, so profound. And yet what it did, it expanded my, my, connection my feelings of uh, the person we call jesus um and and i realized in many ways what he was teaching was so much different than what i believed it, it, it like opened this whole new doorway of how i experienced my own divinity which was very difficult for me to say for years anastasia you processed it for a year or two i processed it for seven or eight years because i had i had experienced that I was divine, that I was perfect. And I did not say that. 
And yet now when I read or ponder and, and, and let me just be as bold as to say, I am so close to this ascended master we call Jesus. But I realize what he was teaching is of our divinity. You know, I mean, the glory you gave me, Father, I have given them. You know, what, walk on the water, Peter. Why do you doubt? You know, greater things will you do than I am. I'm, I'm quoting biblical New Testament scripture. He was teaching of our divinity. He was teaching of our connection. He was teaching of our oneness. And, and yet somehow that gets shrouded and, and turns into judgment and, you know, hell. And, and, and I know I just, you know, I, so many people may disagree with what I say. I, I get so much hate mail when I speak of unconditional love because many want to back into, no, it is all conditional. And, and, and yet my experience was something so different than that. I am, I'm a big, bigger, and I don't know what use, words to use. I'm a bigger fan. I'm a bigger, you know, I have a stronger connection with Jesus than I ever did before my near-death experience. But it also has, I've realized, wow, you know, it, it is not about religion. It, it's not about Christianity. It's about love and and. And we're all on our own perfect, unique journey, whatever religion we adhere to or follow or none at all. It's our perfect path. And, and I often feel like religion segregates us so much, you know, and, and, and yet sometimes it, it may not even bring us closer to the divine. If it, if it brings us closer to the divine, to our source, to our greater power, whatever that is for someone personally, that's, that's great. Now, Having said that, religion does some beautiful things in the world. I mean, some wonderful things. Organized religion can be a powerful force for good. I, you know, I see all the things about refugees recently on, you know, on, on social media and what's going on. Gosh, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, the Catholic Church alone has done more for refugees with, with, you know, millions of dollars and man hours and power. Organized religion can be a very good thing. So when I say, wow, religion, you know, was undone for me. Yes, it was, but I honor it. And yet now it, it seems like it's the means to that end of really embracing not only the divinity within myself. And, and, and Karen, you, you said this, the divinity in everyone else. You know, the divinity within everyone else. I mean, there's that. Beautiful term that Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, in my new death experience, I experienced God. I, I used to daydream about what will that be like to see God. But now when I read that verse, it, it, it is different. And I'll get blasted for this too. I'm not changing the Bible, but when I read that verse, it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God in everything and in every one. And that's, that's what shifted for me. Suddenly, it was not just, you know, this, what, this creator out there somewhere. It became a part of me and it became a part of everyone else. And as I read and look, I, I feel like that's what Jesus was teaching. That's what he was perpetuating. That was his message. That was his ministry. And, and he is, for me, an icon of empathy. You know, he descended beneath all things. that could rise above them all so that he would have empathy. And given what I've been through and, and, and even the near-death experience, you know, people have asked me that too. What did you get? What did you get out of all this? If you were to boil that down to one thing. Now, my first answer was unconditional love. Yes, but what did I get? What did I gain? I really believe it's empathy. Compassion made me a more compassionate person. And I love the compassion and the empathy, you know, in the figure of Jesus. And I embrace that and, and honor that. And, and, and I love him. And I love so many of the ascended masters and all those that show up in life to bring us together, to create that oneness 
that Jesus spoke about in John chapter 17, rather than trying to divide us and uh, make us sin. Oh, I, I can't say how much I agree with all of what you've said. For me, this year, it's going to be 40 years since I had my near-death experience. And at the time that I had it, I was I saw myself as being a born-again Christian. And with that concept that I had of it at that point in time, I worried a great deal about being good enough to, to be there in heaven. And on the same path, I knew that there were relatives of mine, people I loved dearly, like my father and my brother, who had never been born again Christians. And so one part of me was saying, well, they're not going to be there if I do, if I am there. So there was all of this concern and, and judgment of them and of myself and of everyone prior to my having my, my dear, near death experience. And when I had it and I had my life review, all I felt was complete acceptance, non-judgment, unconditional love. And that word unconditional is very difficult for people to wrap their head around because this life on earth is such a conditional and competitive and judging environment. So after my near-death experience, I went through quite a period of time when I, I described it as trying to fit the square peg into the round hole. I, I took what my experience was and then tried to carry it back into the fundamentalist church that I had been in. And every time I, I heard sermons on judgment and sermons on the sheep and the goats and, and those that make it and those that don't, all of that just grated against me so much and was so not in, in resonating with what I had experienced that eventually I ended up stepping away from, from religion, structured religion as a whole, and trying to learn more and more about what I had actually felt and learned through my near-death experience. Over time, I ended up coming back to the church, but with a whole different attitude toward who Jesus is, who Jesus always was. And I, I went through a course that was a four-year course called Education for Ministry. And it was basically to learn all about the Bible and about Christianity aimed at lay people within the church and how they could find their, their mission or their job. And what I learned, I learned so much during that about that fit with what I had actually experienced in my near-death experience. And I learned that there were a lot of historical details that were distorted when coming from the original Hebrew and going through Greek translations, and then finally coming into time periods where the church became very political and was the Church of Rome, and how much got built into the faith that was so much different than the simplicity of Jesus's message. And when you really looked at it, that message of unconditional love was there all along all the way through, there were, I got so that when I read scripture, I could read what was unconditional love and God and what was man's version of fear that had twisted the message and made it into something that didn't fit with who Jesus actually was. A prime example is Jesus, when he was on the cross, said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And he also said to the thief, he said, you know, this day you will be with me 
in paradise. Now that flies in the face of a lot of fundamental Christianity because he didn't say, first acknowledge that I'm the only son of God and ask me to forgive all of your sins and then you will be able to be in heaven. He said this day unconditionally. And he also didn't say that when you die, when I come back a second time, your body's going to be re resurrected and then you will be able to be in heaven with me. So there are a number of things that when you really study in depth, which I took the time to do, don't add up with what a lot of what the actual church does continue to teach. And that's not, that's not their fault. They are dealing with the Bible as it stands today and after it went through a lot of what it went through. But Jesus himself was that ascended master who was here to teach that love was the answer and, and that unconditional love. And it was expressed in many different ways. And, and so I see him that way. And I, I feel him in the same way I felt God's unconditional love during my near-death experience. And so I honor him, and there's a, I honor a great deal of what did filter through and still ended up in Scripture today. So I guess if you're asking, how do I see Jesus? I love him, as Jeff said, and I honor him, and I feel that I now understand his message in ways that I never did before. I, I just want to chime in and say, Amen. Thank you. That's, I mean, it's so hard to put this in words and, and it's so loaded. And I, I know the others want to speak. I, I'm too, I, 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 I read a, a book called Prayers to the Cosmos, which went through that, you know, I went from the, the ancient uh, Aramaic, you know, to the Hebrew, to the Greek, to the Germanic language, to the, I mean, you know, and, and it wrote down some of this language and what it really may have meant back when it was said or when it was done. You know, I, I went into a deep dive of all those things. And I think, and I, I just want to say this and then we can move on. The basis of my belief before the near-death experience was that I was not good enough. I never would be good enough, you know, that, that I was unworthy. That I, yeah. No matter what I did, I would never be good enough in the eyes of God. I, I would never qualify. And, and, and that was, you know, that was held very, I mean, that was my belief that shifted when, when I was held in the arms of God, um, I felt that love and, and, and the interesting thing for me, and I know many of you have read the book, I was holding my own son who was killed in the car crash. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was multiplied. It was magnified. Here I am holding my own son and, and, and you know how much you love him. him. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, Hey, you're every bit as much my boy as that little child you fooled. Do you not understand how much we love you? And I didn't, I mean, God was fear and judgment and, and, and a measuring stick. And suddenly it became a very personal divine connection multiplied by me holding my own child. And, and yet it was a very personal experience, but it, it, it rippled out. I knew that was true of every living soul. I don't care what color, creed, religion, preference. I, I, I felt it as if the whole universe was, was, was singing to me. Look at the love that God, the divine, whatever words you want to put on it, has for its children, for the manifestations, for you and you and you and you and you and all of this. I, I, you've put me on a soapbox, Karen, but thank you for sharing. And I, I just wanted to, I mean, this, this isn't, it was a personal experience. It's only my experience. I'm not saying I have the answers. I'm just saying based on my experience, wow, suddenly I, I understood what love was. And suddenly I understood that Jesus was a manifestation of that love. And yet so can I be, and so can all of us. 
And doesn't it make you think like your experience with your son and, and God made me think of the scripture where Jesus t- is trying to tell the people who among you, if your child asked you for bread, would give him a stone? You know, how much more does your father in heaven love you and want to give to you? Yeah. you so, and, and so within the church, I now find that there are so many wonderful people within the church, as you described, who are giving up their love and wanting to, to give that love to other people. And that community of love is a great place, a good feeling. I just feel bad that all of them don't realize that the T's don't need to be crossed, the I's don't need to be yeah, dotted. They are already enough. And I, I feel sometimes people are, are doing a lot of the good things they're doing to try to feel worthy as opposed to already knowing that, that they are. And I think this is such a, a big question that we could have probably set aside this entire fireside chat just to talk around this one topic. Uh, and, and contrary to, to Jeff and to Karen's um, experience, I grew up in an atheist house. My mother was an atheist. She raised me to have morals and values simply for the sake of having them, but they were not molded around the idea of a meeting a religious judgment or following a religious script. And so in my 20s, early 30s, I was thrusted into the Christian church and the Christian world through um, my family. And when I started reading the Bible, one of the things that really stood out to me was this idea that I I felt that the, the messages that were coming through were really about love. If I were to take the word Jesus and put the word love in its place throughout the Bible, it would be one and the same. And there was one verse in particular that, that stood out to me prior to my NDE, and I understand it at a very deep level now. And that was, and I am not the Bible person, so please, if anybody knows this actual verse, I, I know I'm not going to get this quite right. But it's something along the lines of, you can do everything I can do and more. And at the time, it really struck me that what, what I was reading and how I interpreted that was, We're all together in the ability to do these wonderful, caring, loving, miraculous acts of service. And that Jesus wasn't meant to be put on a pedestal, that it was more a partnership. It was an equal. It was a example, if you will, an example of what our potential is here, not only in the human body, but just our potential to be unconditional love. Fast forward to after my NDE. And I believe I said this, Melissa, in our conversation, in our first interview, I just sum it up by saying that God is a verb. God God is not a noun. God is action. God is love. God is unconditional. And if you make God and Jesus synonymous, it's one and the same. And I would even go so far as to say with the, the connection of the oneness that I experienced, Jesus would be one with all of us. It, it wouldn't be something separate. We are all connected. We are as much a part of a Jesus as a Jesus is a part of all of us. And there is no um, need to prove ourselves. There is no need to get a lesson right. There is no need to check a box here. We can simply look to Jesus as the example of our potential to be loving, compassionate, empathetic human beings with each other. Yeah, I mean, you all just summed it up uh, beautifully and perfectly. Um, I, I came, come from a very, you know, modern Orthodox, you know, Jewish background. So this for me on a personal level has been one of the most challenging topics of conversation uh, to have my near-death experience. But, you know, I think that's with any breakthrough is, you know, not focus so much on the outside opposition, but the inner, you know, energy that you have and what you're connected to. That's a test that I know Jesus really, was really about that, right? When you know, he was talking about the pillars of foundation, of his own faith and the opposition, and that's the life that he lived. And I think, you know, with with eternal life, it's open ended. It's eternal. It's infinite understanding. And I think, as a near death experiencer, that's the way that I look at all of life, where I don't have a possessiveness 
of what is, but I look at everything with curiosity, exploration, and it's open-ended versus closed-ended. And I think, you know, books and... You froze. We lost you, Jake. I was going to say, <laughs> didn't freeze up on you, guys? Uh, but yeah. I, when I, in the portion where I was telling you about trying to fit the square peg into the round hole, I think with Jesus's own followers, that they had all been um, steeped in their Judaism and their conditional God that they had been taught all of their lives. And so they, I think for a long time themselves, were taking that square peg and trying to fit it into the round hole of God as they knew God through their Judaism. So I understood that completely because of having having gone through the experience of me trying to fit my experience and, and the God I encountered into all of the, the boxes that I had within my Christianity faith up to that point. Yeah. Uh, and it's so much, so much broader than that, so much um, more expansive than that. Uh, and yet, as Anastasia said, Jesus, I believe, was sent purposely to try to say this is unconditional love in action yeah this is how it happens and how you would how you can express it and all of you can and all of you have it within you the kingdom of heaven is within you so much of that um i i, 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 love, I love that yeah i do love that and i I've contemplated this much. I mean, I, you know, this, like I say, Jesus is, is the iconic figure in my life. It's like, yep, that's my mentor. That's, 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 that's the man I, you know, and, 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 you know, Buddha, Krishna, Muhammad, I mean, you know, you could go into many, many masters and many, many ascended masters. Interesting enough. And, and I wish Jake was still on. Jesus still chose to be Jewish. He practiced his Judaism right up to the very end, you know, she's, and, and so in my own life, I'm like, wow, there, you know, this experience has expanded me in so many ways. And yet I can still, I can still honor my religious practices and perhaps they'll mean even more rather than doing it because ooh, I want to somehow be worthy. I can do it to honor and, and truly commune rather than trying to check off the block boxes, you know, and, and please a, a figurehead. <laughs> I think your head that's, that's going to be angry at me no matter what I do anyway. So it, it's, it's a beautiful conversation and it's a, it's a loaded conversation. I guess you kind of, you, you've brought the questions that are going to make us dig deep and, and find the words here. Well, thank you all for sharing your perspectives here. It's too bad that we lost Drake right when he was in the middle of talking but if he comes back on maybe we'll give him a chance to finish did anyone else want to say anything before we move on to the third question oh okay. you know what i would say i would say this because there's going to be people listening and say well what about my religion well, what about my beliefs or what about the fact that i don't have one or that i whatever brings you closer to the divine whatever brings you closer to that divine part within yourself that says wow i feel that love I feel that light. I feel that peace and joy. Do that. I mean, do that. We, we tend to want to fight over religion or debate, you know, scripture or debate beliefs. And it's like, you know what? If we could put all that aside and honor whatever brings an individual closest to the divine. Gosh, I've had beautiful experiences in the church pew. I've had beautiful experiences in sweat lodge. I've had beautiful experiences, you know, sometimes in the darkest moments of my life <laughs> that, that, you know, brought me closer to the divine. And that's what I invite people to honor. Do those things that let you feel God's love or allow you to feel closer to that. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm that's probably exactly it. That's exactly it. Yeah, I'm uh, rambling. But don't, don't dismiss religion or your beliefs. Sure. Lean into those and do those things that bring you closer to the divine. I just learned there's no judgment of what that looks like. It's an individual core, and I will honor the path someone's on if it, if it, if it brings them closer to love and being more loving. I think there's another piece to this, too, because, you know, since my 
my experience, I have just been such a consumer of so many other near-death experiences. I just am so magnetized to them. I want to hear about them. I want to learn about everybody's experience. And what I find so fascinating, and it seems universal across the board for the ones that I've listened to, that regardless of your religious um, perspective and position going into an NDE, everybody pretty much universally comes out with the same feeling, the same knowing that it is an unconditional, all-loving oneness. Some people may call it a God. Some people may put religious figure names on it. But in the end, even if you were to extract all that, you were to unwrap all of those terms that we've used and, and have all agreed collectively to say that this represents unconditional love or this represents unconditional love. If you could take all those away, what's left is all the same. We've just used the different ways that our culture and the way that we've grown as a society to try to understand our place in that unconditional love. But when you take it all away, it's all the same. Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought that up, Jeff, because it's it's so it's such an important point, I think. Well, I, and, and I'll just, I mean, there was a point I thought, gosh, maybe I should just leave church. Maybe I should just not go. Maybe, what, what am I, what am I getting out of it? And yet, you know, spirit, I call it spirit that whisper said, well, what are you giving to it? Maybe yeah. rather than walking away from it, maybe you could be a light within it. You know, maybe you could actually be a light within it and have influence in your circle of, of influence in a small community or a small congregation and, 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 you know that might be a way of being loved and serving in a way that you wouldn't have if you just went into a cave all alone and meditated on. And that's, and I'm not, I'm not dismissing that either. I do that some days too, but Jake is back. I wanted to hear what yeah, Jake, Jake. Said. Yeah, yeah, Jake. You know, it was, it was interesting. I mean, as we know with near death experiencers, we have a big impact on technology and this personifies it. So <laughs> thank you so much for your understanding. I am really sorry. What I'm using now is my backup computer. I was able to link it up and it worked. Mercury oh. is in retrograde, which impacts communication, internet connection. So I am so sorry about that. Thank you so much for your understanding. Thank goodness for my other backup computer. <laughs> hey, where we've all had those technical issues and it kind of goes with being a near death experience. You know, I've, I've been noticing that much later, but I, I'm so sorry about that. But yes, you know what I was saying is, the the relationship with God and, you know, Jesus is very much, you know, personal and it's very much open-ended. And, you know, I continually have daily further understandings and further connections from that inner relationship. And I think part of the issue is um, when you have an experience, the energy of that experience that Jesus had, you know, a lot of uh, the energy of also has been reflected on you know, what happened on the cross and some of the opposition. And I think so much of people who are into Jesus are really so much of the oppressors throughout history versus embodying who he truly was. And so I think really what's about is, is just like taking an orange and squeezing it out and focusing on what the essence is there versus coming from the ego and chopping things up and uh, being like Christ versus the oppressors. I think that's important. And but yes, you know, it does personify, you know, us near-death experiencers and eternal life and having, in a way, I look at near-death experiencers as Christ-like, and that might sound pompous or you know, arrogant in a way, but I think so many people, so many near-death experiences go through the pits of trauma, not only what happens to us physically, but also, you know, having to explain ourselves and having a world that pushes back and ridicules us. And so... I think near-death experiencers have a lot of, you know, in common with the life that Jesus lived. And I think so much of what we do is really to personify that same exact message, you know, that, you know, of love, of eternity, of the kingdom, you know, that we're all connected to and that we're not here just to create heaven on earth, but we literally are beings of heaven here on earth. And we're here to remember that each and every day and every way. So I'm hoping that Jesus will be with me on my computer and this Wi-Fi, and I'm I'm hooked up to that. So, you know, <laughs> I, I I I'm gonna have internal net versus net. <laughs> when when you jumped up, I was reminding the group that Jesus was Jewish. He practiced his Judaism. That's right. right. He was like a socialistic Jewish rabbi. You know, people forget. That. 
Yeah. You want more? I, I yeah, I, I I do I do love that, and I think it's it's important to embrace those things and 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 be open to whatever comes. You know, just be open to the possible things. Yeah, it's boring when you have like this is it kind of thing, and eternity isn't you know infinite isn't just that. It's 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 infinite. It goes on and on, and so that's yeah. Beautiful. And and this this will this may sound blasphemous to some, you know. I mean. Of course, Jesus was crucified. That was his charge, was blasphemy. He was saying, I'm divine. I'm a divine manifestation of that. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why do you ask such silly questions, right? And, and there's all kinds of theologies wrapped around that. But we could embrace as humanity the, the story of Jesus as a personal path. Wow. You know, what, what crosses do I have to bear? And I'm not comparing that. I'm just saying we all will bear our own crosses. We'll, we will all have our own Gethsemanes. We will all, you know, have to lay down that part of us that, that, that must die to rise into a greater consciousness, a, a greater way of being, a more divine, eternal. I mean, it, to me, it's embracing the, inter- the, the eternal divine beings that we are and, and kind of laying aside those things that don't, serve or support our highest good. I, 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 I think, I think uh, Anastasia said it. I mean, Jesus, was, was he the perfect prototype for what we were all created to be, that kind, compassionate, loving, divine, eternal being? Well, I, I, you know, I, I, I can embrace that. And it inspires me. Rather than making me feel unworthy and not good enough, that inspires me to say, hey, you know what? Tomorrow I can get up and do a little bit better, perhaps, you know? Wonderful. Question number three is, is there any spiritual significance to the things we are experiencing in the world? And if so, how can we best position ourselves during this time? I will chime in and say there's spiritual significance to everything. There, there is no accidents. There are no coincidences. There's spiritual significance to everything. Now, on a personal level, that may be interpreted different ways. You know, I mean, during the pandemic and the lockdowns, I realized how important connection is. And it may not be a physical connection, but a spiritual connection. Wow. Honoring our bodies, you know, this magnificent machine, which mine was so beat up and I still deal with pain and the injuries and all that goes with it. But what an incredible, magnificent machine our bodies are. I don't have to remind my lungs how to breathe or tell my heart to beat or teach my eyes how to see. What an, what an incredible machine, you know, and so honoring, honoring that. Um, also, you, you never know what may come next. We, we have no idea what tomorrow brings, so don't worry about it. Take no heed. Take, you know, what you'll eat or drink on the morrow. Be in the present moment of now. Be in the present moment of right now and enjoy that. Consider the birds, how they fly. Consider the woolies, how they grow. All these teachings of the master Jesus of, of being in that present moment of, of, of right now. And what do I do right now? You know, what do I do today? And what's important as my heart beats without being reminded? And what am I being maybe is far more important than what am I doing? I think too, as far as this particular question, I think uh, what can be paramount right now and is for a number of different people are the aspects of fear and the aspects of separateness and antagonism between people who are convinced of one thing and people who are convinced of another thing. And I think we're going through this this time period and these experiences to help us express conditional love even in these circumstances. And I love what you said about really appreciating connectedness because it seems as though this is something that's trying to, these experiences are tending to pull us apart rather than connect us together. So unconditional love says, how can we still connect? 
And how can we still keep expressing that unconditional love in these otherwise challenging experiences? It feels like to me, we, 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 we plant bulbs in the fall here. The bulbs that we put in the dirt in the ground. I, I'm in Utah and we do that in the fall. So in the spring, these beautiful flowers come up. But in order for that to happen, that bulb has to completely come apart. It literally has to come undone. And, and sometimes for me, it feels like, wow, everything's coming undone. That, that perhaps something far more beautiful something far more, you know, lovely might, might emerge out of. Yeah. I, I think from, from the perspective that I have right now, and I have to acknowledge the fact that I'm still very early in processing of everything I experienced. And so I feel like there's still this continuous unfolding of what I experienced and how I understand it and how I talk about it. But for where I'm at right now, I think in, in one hand, on one hand, it's really hard for, at least for me, to try to comment on that because I still have a very close um, connection to that experience of oneness, to the experience of being complete, to the experience that there is nothing that is wrong. And so when I look around me and I see the, the world struggling with something like a, a collective experience, like a pandemic, and the personal traumas and struggles that families have when they've lost loved ones or they lost their livelihood, their jobs, and, and just all the things that we hear that are happening, especially for those that, you know, live in America and they see the polarization that's happening within our country. We can all look at that and focus on all of those aspects and really feel pretty crummy about it. But so close to this experience that I've had, I look at it and go, it's all exactly perfect. It's all reflective of what we all bring to this experience right now. And if you were to take this entire lifetime and you were to take this, this life from the moment we're born until the moment we die, some of them are shorter, some of them are longer, but regardless of the length of time, every single life is precious, whether it's one second of life or a hundred years of life. And so when we can focus in on the fact that right now we each have an opportunity to do something miraculous and not focus on the fear and the limitations and the, the traumas, but really focus on, on the beautiful aspect of life being a miracle, it becomes a very different conversation. But at the same time, I can say that because I've experienced something outside of this that I can reflect and compare it to. Not everybody actually gets that opportunity. But if you were to take this entire lifetime in comparison to the entire life of a soul, and I use the word soul very loosely. I know there's different people call it something different, but I love the word soul because if you break down the acronym, it's the spirit of unconditional love. And to me, that's exactly what we are. So for me, the soul is just the, this beautiful, infinite expression of oneness in this lifetime, as long as it may seem. As a blink of an eye. It is, it is one little itty bitty little grain of sand in an entire earth of, of possibilities. It's just one, one experience. And we have infinite experiences as a soul. And so I think on one hand, when you put the experience of what's going on in that perspective, it really minimizes the fear and the need to, to be reactive. And it puts us more in a place of being compassionate and understanding and, and looking for what we can do for our own part in all of it to, to help us move past her. It's beautiful. And I love your soul and spirit of unconditional love. Thank you. It came to me right after my NBE. So I just kind of use that now for, I, I know that there are so many different ways that we can reflect to that part of ourselves that isn't physical. And different people have different words that they use. But for me, it, it does boil down to unconditional love. Yeah. You know, today, uh, now that we're recording it, um, I was just notified that a great um, spiritual teacher and leader from Plum Village by the name of Thich Nhat Hanh at 90, I think he was 95, crossed over. And those familiar with Thich, you know, he really personified, you know, mindfulness, you know, presence. And on Netflix did a documentary on him called Walk With Me, but just an amazing incredible leader and 
just you could sense his energy and just take one look and just feel presence. And, you know, I, I think really that's what these times are about, where, yes, you can go to a Tibetan monastery and be there. But I think this pandemic over the last couple of years has forced in one way or another, hopefully people to retreat to someplace inward and to live from the inside out versus the outside in. And there's many ways to engage with impermanence. I think a lot of people talk about eternity on the other side, but they think there's eternity here in the physical body. And as near-death experiencers, we're here to attest that this body is finite. We're infinite. But this body, this lifetime, this ego, this personality, this path, you know, has, you know, is finite. And so how do we engage with that? And I think that's been expedited to a lot of people where we just went on cruise control versus having a, a recollection of that. New death experiences, remember that. And so we can engage with that in fear, trepidation, divisiveness, attacking, you no, know, or we could engage in mindfulness with wisdom, compassion, understanding, and understanding that it's very, the life that we live is very reflective of how we connect to that inner being. And that's how we see and reflect on others. And so I think it's really about being present in the present and living while we're living because so many people, you know, have not it's lived an outside in versus inside out. And, um, you know, that's something that near-death experiencers understand, but this, the same playbook, but this rug being pulled of this life that we were living just kind of yanked from us and now having to, you know, adjust, you know, and obviously there's a lot of trauma that people go through and it's a similar storm. Everyone's in their own unique situation as we alluded to, but we have to, yes, integrate mindfulness, but integrate mindfulness with a good foundation, you know, of wisdom, compassion, empathy, and interconnection, you know, versus being kind of a leaf in water versus generating this own beautiful current within. I think that's what's important during these times. Can I just say, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just taking this in. I mean, Melissa, this is, this is as big for me as anybody. I'm, what what wonderful comments and sentiments and wisdom. I love it. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I feel the exact too. same way just sitting here, taking everything in. Shall we move on to question four? Or did anyone else want to say something? No, that's fine. Okay. I love it. He can't stay open. This is great. Wow. Uh, beautiful. Question number four is what would you say to those who are dealing with the grief of losing a loved one? Wow. That one I know well. <laughs> They're never lost. They're never lost. They, they become our guardian angels. And I realize many people may not experience that. I mean, they were here and now those arms have held me and, and, and you know, they're no longer in this realm. However, they're never that far away. They are so near, and and I remember early on in my grief, that wouldn't have helped. Not no one could say anything or give advice or do anything to assist. Me. If you're in that dark night of the soul, just keep breathing, keep breathing. Get from one breath to the next, and you'll get from one hour to the next, and you'll get from one day to the next, and at at at, at some point, some magical point, I still cry tears of grief but the tears aren't bitter anymore they become sweet they become sweet i i i you know you don't you don't get over it but you do get used to it and the bitter tears become sweet tears and the memories become joyful i i laugh to myself often remembering where i used to just weep but bitterly remembering so hang in there and be kind to yourself and allow yourself to grieve you know, we, we only grieve because we love. I mean, once again, that's a manifestation of love. If we didn't love, we wouldn't grieve. So allow yourself to grieve, but realize it will get better. And, and they're never lost. They're, we're, we're connected no matter what that looks like. You know, when, when someone we love leaves this realm, our love connects us. We're bound by those beautiful codes of love and nothing can break down. And they're closer than you could ever imagine. And I think they laugh at me a lot. My, my, my loved ones who have passed, my guardian, they, they just laugh. They think, oh, look at him, look at him. But they also weep with us too. You know, they weep with us. And we, we may be 
in many ways, most beautiful when we're most broken. You know, when, when we're really in it, I think they look from those other realms and say, wow, look at their learning. Look how their soul is expanded. And they, they send us love. They send us love to this one. So I think it's very common for near-death experiencers to get asked the question from people who are grieving, you know, what, what happens on the other side? Is my loved one okay? You know, am I going to see them again? Am I going to have a chance to reconnect? And one of the things that I've, I've come to understand and, and again, my, my experience is completely fluid and I'm still evolving it in my understanding is that we really kind of come with four core feelings that really represent our experience on a soul level. And love, and we talk a lot about unconditional love, but there's also joy. There's also peace. And I would say the fourth one is grief. I think grief is a true core experience of the soul. We can feel that intimate disconnection from something so deeply that it creates a sense of grief. Now, I want to share a story, and, and this is about you, Jeff, actually. Shortly after my NDE, I was watching videos. And one of the first ones I, I listened to, Jeff, was your story. And I don't know how many times I had to listen to it. I listened to it. I'd stop it. I'd come back. I'd listen to it again because it was so deeply moving. Even for somebody who, you know, hadn't gone through something like that, I, I just couldn't. I had, I had to have time to process listening to it, let alone go through that. And my husband is a widower. And so he lost his wife many, many years ago to breast cancer and was left with two young children to raise on his own before I met him. And your story was so moving. I, I shared it with my husband and said, you know, listen to this. There's such an inspiration, inspirational message here. And yeah, he, he did listen to about half of it. And he was so overwhelmed by your story, he couldn't listen anymore. And so that just really amplifies the fact that grief is real. And I, and I think when we, we talk about the other side of this beautiful experience, at least for me, I learned I have to be very cautious that I don't invalidate the experience of grief of those that are still here. You can still grieve and also acknowledge the fact that your loved one is in peace. They are in a blissful place. They are complete and you will see them again. But I also feel like because of our, our experiences with the other side, we, we come back with somewhat of a unspoken responsibility to be really cautious and straddle that line carefully with those people who have experienced intense grief. I like the way you commented about the core things and when I talk about my experience, I often, you know, I start with the unconditional love, but I also always talk about the tremendous amount of joy that I experienced and what the unbelievable peace, because the peace was one of those things that came back with me right away and that I was filled with and surrounded with uh, right after as I came back into my body and continued for weeks after that. But then adding on to that, the grief. I think the grief, like you said, it's a key, key thing because it's, it's a great part of our souls growing in compassion because without that deep sense of the grief that you experience, it's very difficult to be as empathetic and compassionate as a, a full soul wants to be and can be. Uh, so it is, it's very important. And I do get contacted quite a bit by people who have lost a loved one. And like you said, it's a very delicate path to cross in, in communicating with people because that is, it, it's so important to acknowledge the depth of that grief and to not not to minimize it in any way by trying to trying to project just love and and joy and 
those opposite emotions and feelings. The grief is important. It's difficult to go through. You do truly miss that physical person, and there's just no way to minimize it. But simply to be with someone as they're experiencing it and to to acknowledge it and and not in any way, shape, or form minimize it. Um, um, it's just so important. I love what you all said. You all, there's not much to add. So really, um, brilliant. Thank you. And I love what if you're familiar with Ram Das. I know he passed in transition maybe a year or two ago. He had some quote that said, "You could be as far in the stars as." can be and transcend, but you still have to change the tire or go to the DMV or do all these things. And so a point that I'm trying to make is, you know, I think a lot of people have judgment of themselves and what they go through and they feel I'm transcended. I shouldn't feel, and you know, that's, that's a part of being human. We're a spiritual being having this human experience, but so much of this experience is really to broaden our heart and to understand it on a deeper level. Cause I don't think we're just going through this for ourselves, but I think so much of this is to be able to understand other people in this experience. And when we do cross over, become a guide and we are able to have that understanding from our own experience. But, you know, I love the quote that really says within the dead of the winter, you could find a summer. And I think with any bit of, of difficulty or hardship, you know, that is the beauty of of transformation. It doesn't mean that the person or the situation is exactly how it was, but you evolve with it, you grow with it, and eventually you find that you are transformed in your own way. Um, but there are plenty of organizations you know, out there. And I think mm -hmm. the difficulty is when you're going through things is isolation. And, you know, isolation to me is feeling very alone in your experience and not connected. And Certainly as a near-death experiencer, we probably had that for a bit of time. I know I had that for almost two decades where I didn't even know what this was called or the terminology behind it. So finding support, finding good people. I know Jeff is a champion of one organization that I'm going to speak with on Monday called Helping Parents Heal, which mm -hmm. works very closely, you know, with those parents and shining star parents who, who, who you know, have kids who transition. You know, other organizations are great. Forever Family Foundation is great. I know I, I work with them, you know, a couple of times. So, you know, when there's a readiness, have support and understanding that there's a collective force that could really repel you and carry you for that you don't, you're not doing this alone. There's those in the spirit here with you, but that those here in the physical that come through, you know, as angels in human form too, that could, you know, just be there and really join you and elevate you know, the transformation that you could experience with grief and you will with your time. That's fantastic. Jake, they're an amazing organization and, and international. They're worldwide. There's chapters of helping parents heal all over the world. And they do such good work in just supporting one through the grief process. It's a process. There's no way to go around, but you're going to go through it. And anyway, they, well, yeah, you know, you don't have to go through it alone. And they're a fantastic organization. They're they're having a big conference in Phoenix. In yeah, 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 yeah. They're great. Uh, I'll be there. You may be there too, Jake. But it's going to be an wonderful gathering. Yeah. Anyone else? No. All right. Final question. You all have talked tonight about how this life is an experience that our soul is having. So how can we get the most? out of this life experience while we're here. Wow. Live it. Live it. Live your life. You know, go out and do the things that bring you joy. For me, and you know, I'm older and gray now, but I tell you what, the joy is in the little things. And the joy is in the little things. I, I don't see a sunset anymore without thinking, wow, that's a miracle. You know, I don't see a flower bloom, but I'm saying, wow, that's a miracle. I don't see the leaves, you know, change on the trees and yeah. flutter to the ground without saying, wow, that's a miracle. It, it, it doesn't, you know, life, all of our lives are unique. We're going to have unique and different experiences, but our emotions are what connects us. Our emotions are what we have universal. And 
live life. Let your emotions flow. Be happy. Be sad. Be angry. Be joyful. Be, be in love. Be all of those things because that's what we came for. That's what we came for. For Here's more biblical. I remember when Jesus said, for this cause came I into the world. You know, and as we're going about our day-to-day lives, whether that's joyful or painful, for this cause is why we came. So enjoy it. Let the emotions flow. Live your life and love the people around you. Love the people around you. Love is the most powerful force in the universe. And as you love the people around you, please remember to love yourself. I'd become so good at loving your neighbors. Love that your neighbor has yourself. And the neighborly experience unlocked the key for me to realize I could love myself, that I was enough, and that I had a unique contribution in this time around, in this realm. And by being it, I could simply be perfect. By, by simply being it, you're perfect just the way you are. So live your life and be happy. Well, I always come back to fearing. And that's just such a, a takeaway from my experience of we are experiencing what it feels like to be a soul in a physical body. And so I would encourage people to ask themselves if they could feel the best they could possibly feel, what would that be? And if their answer doesn't reflect their state of being in that moment, then be curious about what you can do to get there. And if you can allow yourself just a little bit of room to, explore and be curious about what that would be if you were to take away all judgment, all fear, and just sit for a moment and have the faith in yourself that you are a powerful creator. We have so much creative potential. We haven't even scratched the surface. And if you could have absolute control to create your experience, would you make different choices in your life? And if you would, then what's keeping you from making those choices now? And it's just a matter of exploration, but having the courage to know that you can have those questions, they're questions that really will help you move forward. And in the end, it really comes down to your experience here is something that you can create the best feeling that you could ever imagine if you have the courage to step into it. I'd like to say too that, you know, I think. It comes down to show your whole soul fearlessly. And that's the good, the bad, and the ugly. You don't have to be some sort of paragon of virtue to be able to relate to other people and to be able to show them that love that you have within. So I guess that... That's what I think is don't be afraid, be fearless, don't wear a mask and try to be something, just be your whole soul and be it fearlessly. Yeah. Um, I, I learned so much from Albert Einstein and, you know, he posed such a great question, which uh, in a point, which the most important uh, question that we have to live our lives governed by is the universe or God or however you want to look at it, you know, a loving place or or not, or a limited place or not. And I think near-death experiencers come with this message of of knowing, you know, and trust in this higher intelligence that we're connected to that's navigating our lives that is occurring while we're here. And I think sometimes we go through this lifetime feeling alone in this vacuum forgetting there's this infinite intelligence that was behind, you know, the life that was charted and that we live and that we go through. And so I think so much of that is about trust and a knowing and trusting an infinite intelligence more so than our great, than our at times limited perceptional viewpoints. And that will transform an unlimited, a limited life to an unlimited life. And I think a lot of the life that we live is parlayed by our faith and our relationship and perceptional viewpoint, you know, of that exact reference. And, you know, it projects the life that we live. Um, but, but yes, chop wood and carry water, as a Buddhist would say. I think it's important to do the work still. We're, we're here to be human. You know, our time is there. I once went to my grandmother and I, I was upset because the summer was ending. 
And she's 97 years old. And she says, and she says, don't worry, we'll come back. We'll come back. And I allude the summer as the, the, the infinite world. And we're going through this in this life where we sometimes worry that this, this won't end. We'll, we'll never, you know, go on how we go through this, but we always persevere. We always move forward. We, you know, cannot be damaged or harmed on a macro basis. And all these experiences are just there for uh, growth, expansion, evolution, and it's a gift. So I think, yes, what Jeff alluded to and the great Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, lived his life by is to focus on being versus doing. We're a human being, not a human doing, you know? So it's in the being part. <laughs> you guys inspire me. I just, I love what you say. I mean, you know, we, we've talked a lot about, you know, Jesus and the Bible. How many times did he say, fear not, fear not, you know, become as a little child. This is where joy is. I mean, uh, you know, in that, in that awe and wonder of, you know, gosh, I, when my boys were little, they, they, they'd be completely entertained with a stick and a bug all, you know, all, all day long. It was, it was it, it, the musing of being in this body, being in this realm, having the experience we're having. And yet letting go of judgments, comparisons, fears, yeah. and simply being in that joyful state of a, of a child in awe saying, oh, trust, trust. I mean, I think if I was to put in words, my, my faith and my beliefs were absolutely transformed through the experience into trust and to just trust it's all going to be okay. I just want to say that I noticed with all of your responses to this question that you're not giving some list of spiritual practices to do to become enlightened like some spiritual teachers might do, but you're all saying, just be here, be in this experience, be like a child and trust and, and love it, love all of it. And I think we tend to lose that in the spiritual community, the religious community for sure, but also the spiritual community, we tend to lose that. I think yeah. we forget that, you know, there are, there are wavelengths of light that we can't see with our eyes or sounds we can't hear with our ears. And there are jerk concepts that we're not going to necessarily be able to wrap our heads around about why we're here in the total, the totality of our existence here in the physical body. But when it boil, when we boil it all down, it is a matter of experience. We came here to have a physical experience and to have that experience is absolutely integral to the entire whole. We each need to have this experience. It's an important part of what makes the oneness, the God, the divinity, what it is. It couldn't exist without us. All right. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to share before we wrap it up? Maybe we could do one last statement by each experiencer. Like with that, what do you think by, by that, guys? Is that like one last message? Yeah, That's absolutely. my favorite question by every interviewer. I love <laughs> Okay, yeah. One last, what's one final message that you'd like to share? Who would like to go first? Oh, gosh. I, I've been going first only so I can get it over with, so I can yeah. just have it pretty I don't want to be thinking about what to say. I've been really listening to you all. And I, I just, I, I want to stay connected if possible. Oh. Closing, closing words. You know, it's a choice. That, that, that's, that was the profound thing in my near-death experience is that now I embrace, there's only one cosmic rule, and that is free will and choice. You get to choose. And in all that choice, you know, let's, let's choose joy. Choose joy for yourself and for others and, and lean into that energy and see what that doesn't shift. We're so powerful as, as creators. I, I, everything that's been said, it's like, oh, I love it. Um, but yeah, choose joy. You, you are in control no matter what happens to you. And you can't control that, but you can control how you experience it and what you learn from it. And therefore, gratitude can rise out and you can choose to be joyful no matter what happens. I would say that for those of you familiar with my NDE, I know in the intro, I, I'm sorry, I didn't share it, but I had my near death experience in a playground at the age of three years old through the whipping cough and I suffocated. And there's a lot of allegorical and symbolical, you know, levels to my NDE, but the one 
thing that st stands out is the playground and how we're all our brothers and sisters keepers here in God's playground. And I think a lot of people focus on the on mysticism as something up in the higher etherical, but um, I think mysticism is found in relationships and how we're able to treat you know, you know each other because. I don't think our survival depends on it, but I don't think our thrival depends on it, but our survival depends on the interconnectedness that we have and our ability, uh, you know, to really connect each other and to not just have oneness as a new age talking point, but a, something that we integrate and live our lives by. Um, and I think also to live a life by how God thinks and how God sees. That part is really within us. And to look at life through that God lens. And, you know, I think there's many uh, different ways to look at it from uh, religions or other belief systems. At times it could look down, you know, from a possessiveness um, and accomplishment, you know, and down on a people. But I think really the, the God eyes is looking up and to see the beauty and to see, you know, the, the potential and the true nature of all things, always and always. So that's my last message. For tonight. Well, I think that my final message would be that trust and faith are such a foundational thing to our lives here and our experiences that we have on earth. And I think that given that we're all given free will, I just say consciously using free will make those choices that allow you to express love and connect with others and expand their experience and your own. That interconnectedness between all of us leads to that oneness that is, is what we're really here to understand and achieve. Well, if I were to sum it up, I would say it's what I've echoed since I've started sharing my story and that in this physical life, there is no good or bad. There is no right or wrong. There are no lessons to learn in a way that is going to impact what you're going to experience on the other side. You're absolutely whole and complete. Your soul is whole and complete. And you get an opportunity to learn what it means to have a physical experience. But this learning isn't about a worthiness. It isn't about trying to check a box. It isn't your pathway to a heaven or a hell. Your internal heaven and hell is right here. And as cliche as that sounds, you can create it now. And so when you get to the other side, you're going to realize that the oneness that you are is the same oneness that we all are. So when you're looking through your eyes, you're actually looking through the eyes of every single person who's ever lived. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I just want to say how honored and blessed I am to have been able to sit in on this conversation and just take everything in, all of your shared experience and wisdom. It's definitely one of the best things that I have ever done. So it's that inspiring to me. So thank you so much to each one of you for being here and for participating. Thank you for putting this together, Melissa. I mean, how yeah, uplifted I just feel right now. It's, it's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, you're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I've reached out. I'd love, I just shoot me an email. Let's stay connected as a group. This is a pretty, uh, this is a pretty interesting uh, little uh, quartet here. And uh, Melissa, thank you for bringing us together. And, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Oh, of course. Melissa, Plus, I think. I think there was the gift of you in deciding that these four individuals, <laughs> three individuals, all, the, all of us, because you were the orchestrator, was very much meant to be and was a, a unique and very special experience for all of us concerned. Well, each one of you impacted my life already, which was why I thought to invite you back. So thank you for that as well. 
Thank you. I know my computer had a near-death experience. I was supposed to talk about one, but Jay, thank you for having all of us. I, I learned so much from all of you. Thank it's you. It's just uh-huh. your energy, Jake. It's your energy. It zaps out. It zaps out those electronics. You're just too connected still. It's, al- it's allegory. I can't get away from it. Yeah. What an honor. Each all of right, you, guys. each of you, it was such a gift. Yeah. You know, Thanks, Kate. It was wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You all have a beautiful night and be healthy and be safe and be loved. Be loved. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you for watching the Love Covered Life podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, share this video with your friends, and comment with your thoughts and opinions. And check the description box for the links to my TikTok and Instagram where I share the more personal side of my life, my website where I share my paintings and merch, and also the Be A Guest link for anybody who's interested in sharing their story. Be loved, be happy, be at peace, and thank you for watching.